And so today we're starting a series uh, as we head into Christmas called Joseph, the Harbinger of Jesus Christ. Harbinger, how many know what a harbinger is? Yeah, I told my wife the name of the series and she goes, no one's going to know what that is. And uh, she, apparently she was right. Harbinger is a forerunner. It's like a preview. It's like a special showing. It's like an introduction. It's like a, a, a foreshadow. And what we're going to see today and in the weeks to come is God was doing an amazing work in Joseph's life, but not only in his life as an individual, but he was taking his life and using it for the glory of Jesus Christ. The gospel being told in the book of Genesis. Jesus, uh, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, uh, is, the, is the truth that this whole Bible is about one superhero. His name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the King of Kings. He's God in the flesh. And today we begin a story in Joseph, Joseph the harbinger of Jesus Christ. So open up your Bibles to Genesis 37. And as you do, let me kind of set the stage of what's going on. God had called a man to himself to bring a nation, his own special people, to build a nation, to build a special people uh, through who he was going to bring the Messiah through. That man, his name, what was it, church scholars? Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And here's the deal. God looks at the world And he had already destroyed the world by flood. Man, the the imagination of man's hearts was only evil continually. Imagine that. And God brings judgment on the earth and starts over. And then after the flood, we have the Tower of Babel and man going after vain and profane religions, fake religions, and trying to do life without God. and, And on and on and on the story goes. And God says, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to raise up one man, one man, and I'm going to make a nation out of him. And that nation, they'll be my own special people. And I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. And I will make them my own people. I'll be a father to them. And all the nations of the earth will see this special relationship, and they'll know the true and living God through them. That's why we're going to Israel to see all that history of all how that happened. And so God starts, and he starts with this man named Abraham, and he makes a unconditional covenant with Abraham. Unconditional, it means that no matter how bad Abraham and his ancestry is, that covenant will never be broken. It's unconditional just between, God says, I'm going to fulfill it no matter what my people do. And here's the covenant. It's Genesis 12. You don't have to turn there, but here it is. I will be to them a God, they will be to me a people. I will bless them, I will take care of them, I will give them a homeland, I will protect them against anti-Semitism, I will bless those who bless them, I will curse those who curse them, and through them, I will bring the Messiah, through them, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So that's God's plan. Problem? Abraham and Sarah? They don't have any kids. And years go by, years go by, and she's still barren. And now years go by, he's 100 years old, he's impotent, she's menopausal. How is this promise ever going to come into play? Well, God blesses them, and somehow Abraham plays a Barry White song one night, and things go well, and she gets pregnant. Amazing miracle. And she gets pregnant. And that son is Isaac. And Isaac then has twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the one that is the the chosen lineage. Jacob, his name, what does his name mean? It means swindler. It means heel catcher. It means shady shyster. And God changes Jacob's name to what? Israel. Changes him from a shaky shyster to Israel, which means governed by God. All the divine romance of God. Don't you love it? Changes our nature, changes our name, takes me from swindler Dave to governed by God, and that's what he does for each one of us. And this is the story of that divine romance between God and his people and how the story begins. So chapter 37, are you there? 
Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Yeah, that's the promised land. And this is the history of Jacob. You might want to underline that. Here it is. This is the history of Jacob. Or in other words, this is the story of Israel. Right? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Belah, and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Yeah, what is that? We see a few things there. Uh, there's, there's these two women introduced, Belah and Zilpha. Uh, crazy names. Uh, doesn't sound real attractive, but there they are. Uh, who are they? Well, Belah was Rachel's handmaid. Do you remember what happened with Jacob? He fell in love with Rachel. She's beautiful. And his heart, oh, it melts when he sees her. And he goes to Laban, his future father-in-law, and says, man, can I marry your daughter? And he says, well, if you work for me for seven years, you can marry her. So he works for seven years, right? And uh, he goes to marry her. And what does Laban, what does his father-in-law do? A little switcheroo puts the veil on the bride, and when he lifts the veil, guess who he just married? Leah, the ugly sister, the Bible tells us. Not my words, don't get mad at me, right? I'm not calling her ugly. The Bible said she was ugly. Uh, Mary's the ugly sister, and Jacob's like, what happened? Here's what happened. The swindler just got swindled. And he goes, "Uh, well, hey, I I wanted to marry Rachel, and you did a switcheroo on me. And uh, that'd be a horrible thing, by the way. I mean, what a bad trick, right? <laughs> and he says, well, what the heck? And he says, hey, no, the older sister has to get married first. That's just the way it goes. He goes, but I tell you what, I'll let you marry my daughter, Rachel, if you want. You just got to work seven more years. So he worked seven more years for Rachel. And the Bible says he loved her so much that it seemed like it was just a day. Oh, all the girls go, oh, right? So that's the one. Well, here's what happened. Rachel can't have any kids. And so she gets a handmaid called Bila, and she has children through her. And then Leah, the ugly one, she gets past childbearing, and they still want more kids. And so she gets a handmaid called Zilpha, and this is the story of Israel. These are the four women that brought the 12 tribes of Israel uh, into existence, right? And so uh, Joseph is one of those 12 tribes. And he's there, and it says he gives a a bad report to dad about his brothers. And a lot of the commentators will say, hey, Joseph was probably a tattletale. And and maybe, we don't know for sure, it doesn't tell us. I personally don't think so. When we look at Joseph's character, I personally don't think so. I think he had favor in his dad's eyes because uh, he he just had some some character to him. And he probably said, hey, look... uh, uh, The boys are doing this. You might want to know, Dad, you know. And anyway, here's what happens. Verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. That's a problem. uh, Because he was the son of his old age. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, uh, Rachel couldn't have any kids, as I mentioned. And she gets a handmaid and has kids through that. But then God does something amazing. After all these years, Rachel conceives. And she gives a she gives birth to Joseph. And so Joseph is special in Jacob's eyes, in Israel's eyes. And he has a special bond with him. And look what it says. He made him a, a tunic of many colors. A tunic of many colors. The technicolor, the famous technicolor dream coat, right? There it is. Here's what would happen. Each boy would get a tunic, but Joseph's tunic just had more color in it than the other one. It was a little bit longer than the other ones. It was a tunic that showed that the birthright was going to be to that child. And uh, look what happens. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him, that would be Joseph, more than all his brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably to him. Yeah, it was noogies all the time. It was uh, tricks and, you know, hassling and beating them up, and and, uh, just caused a lot of uh, trauma for Joseph. 
Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more for the dream. So he said to them, please hear the dream which I've had. And verse 7, <clears throat> here he goes to explain the dream. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, or in other words, there we were, cutting down the hay and putting it into hay bales. Then behold, my sheaf, my hay bale, rose up, stands up, stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves, your hay bale, they stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. What's that? Yeah, we're out there, we're chopping hay, and my hay bale stands up way taller than all your hay bales, and all your hay bales go, ooh, ah, and bow down to my hay bale. How to win friends and influence people, right? I mean, <clears throat> and look what happens, verse 8, and his brother said to him, what the heck? Uh, paraphrase, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Oh, the jealousy, the hatred, it just begins to build even more and more and more. Now to make matters worse, verse 9, he dreams still another dream and he told it to his brothers. And he said, look, I've dreamed another dream and this time it's the sun and the moon and the 11 stars that bow down to me. So he told it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have dreamed? Or in other words, what, are you a knucklehead? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down to the earth and bow before you? So what was the interpretation of the dream, by the way? The sun was who? No, I'm sorry, the sun, the, the, the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon was dad and mom, and the 11 stars were the brothers. That's important. Do you know why? Because this same imagery is written in the book of Revelation. Revelation is largely a, a quotation of the Old Testament. And in Revelation 12, it uses this imagery and you'll get read commentators on it, and they'll say, oh, this means this, and this means this, and this means, I think it means this. Hey, no, 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 it means Israel, Israel. And it's important. Uh, there's an uh, 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 important term that we have to understand uh, when, when, well, for time's sake, I'm not going to go there. But uh, it, it's important that we don't let the, we, that we interpret the Bible through the Bible. And here, Jacob says, hey, I understand. Are you saying that your mom and I are going to come bow down to you? Are you saying that your 11 brothers are going to come bow down to you? And he rebukes them. Verse 11, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. In other words, his father rebuked him, but he took the matter to heart. He just knew that there was something there to that dream. Here's what I want us to see. Here's what I want us to grab hold of. Pay attention. Make sure you see it. Oh, I hope that you do. God is revealing that Joseph has a calling from God upon his life. Joseph has a calling from God upon his life. And here this calling is being revealed. Joseph, how old is he? Only 17 years old. And here at 17 years old, he senses some kind of unction, some kind of divine calling on his life. Oh, I love how God works, how he takes young men and how he begins to put a calling on their life. By young men, I mean men and women, and begins to put a, a calling on their life. I love our young adults ministry. I love our youth ministries. I love our children's ministry. Your children right now are being taught about the love of Jesus Christ from people who devote themselves to serving Jesus. And you know what happens? It plants these seeds so that when they grow and the Holy Spirit begins to move upon their life, they'll experience this calling. And here Joseph is, ex is experiencing it. And God often reveals his calling on our life long before we're ready to walk in that calling. 
long before we're capable of fulfilling that calling. Joseph is called by God. He's given this uh, this incredible uh, vision of what's to come, but here's the problem. Right now, he does not possess the wisdom, the character, the maturity, or the knowledge of God to be able to walk in this calling. And he is going to go through 13 years of preparation before this calling comes into fruition. But that calling is upon him right now. And it's important that we know this. Uh, Joseph, until he's got to wait 13 years, what is he supposed to do with this calling that's on his life over the next 13 years? What's he supposed to do? It doesn't come into fruition. What's, I mean, what do you do? Here's what you do. You embrace that calling by faith. We embrace the call of God by faith that is on our life. By faith. By faith. Joseph will go through all kinds of hardships, all kinds of successes, and God will be using all of them to bring this calling into fruition upon his life. And along the journey, when things get really difficult, he's going to have to embrace this call by faith. For me, it wasn't 13 years, but can I tell you, it was 11 years, 11 years. You know what happened to me? I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and my brother invited me to church one day, and I went, and I uh, was totally daydreaming, wasn't paying attention at all, maybe like some of you, I was daydreaming. You know what I was daydreaming about? Going dirt bike riding as soon as this stinking service is over, how much longer is this going to last? And there, as I'm sitting in the chair, something happened, didn't plan on it, didn't even know what a Holy Spirit was, but the Holy Spirit just started working in my heart, and next thing I know, I'm sobbing like a baby in this chair. And my wife looks over to me, we're just married, neither of us believers, and she looks at me like, what the heck is going on with you? I'm not a real emotionally expressive, that's unusual for me, and she looks at me like, are you okay? And I look at her like, I got to get out of here. And I run out of the room and I go downstairs and I go into a bathroom and I lock the bathroom bathroom door, nobody in there, and I pray. And I remember my prayer verbatim. I said these words, God, if you're trying to speak to me, you have to use words because I don't understand this. And as I prayed that prayer over a toilet, there in the stall, God's spirit came upon, I didn't know what God's spirit, I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit, but God's spirit came upon me again the second time and I just felt overwhelmed, and I began to sob. I mean, like snot coming out of your nose, sobbing. And I thought, what the heck is going on? And I prayed a second time, God, if you're trying to speak to me, you need to use words. I don't understand this. And I thought, I'm going crazy. I got to go wash my face. got to clean myself. Get it together, Dave. So I wash my face, and I go outside. I go, I need some fresh air. And I see a little janitor's closet with a stairway going up to it on the side of the building. And I walk up the stairs and I go in that janitor's closet and I pray that same prayer again. What is going on, Lord? You need to use words. What is happening? And there a third time, I had this just overwhelming presence of of, just like, and God was just purging me of all of my sin. And I didn't understand what was going on. And I, it's just crazy to say, but I'm going to tell you this right now. Somehow I knew at that time God was calling me, to my, calling me to himself. And somehow I knew at that time God was calling me to be a pastor. And I did not tell anyone for 10 years that I felt God, the call of God, but I felt it from the day he saved me. Many of you have a calling, all of you have a calling of God upon your life. It may not be a call of God to be a pastor. And it doesn't have to have a dramatic experience. I want you to know that was the end of my dramatic experiences. I went home and had no more dramatic experiences, but I did have an incredible hunger to study the Bible. And uh, weeks went by, and I began to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and God began to do this work in my life. And I remember after about five years, I'm studying diligently, I'm serving in a church, I'm working, uh, I'm studying diligently in, in, in you know, education to learn God, the Bible, and, and uh, trying to grow in my walk with the Lord. And, and the first person I told that I felt this calling was my wife. I said, baby, you know what? I know it sounds crazy, but I feel called like God's called me to be a pastor. 
You know what my wife said? Huh? Laughed. And then she said, I don't see it. (laughs) And I said, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. And you know what? We have to embrace the call of God by faith. And it wasn't 13 years for me. It was 11 years before that came into fruition. I actually became a pastor, but I had to embrace that call of God by faith, by faith. And that 11 years of my life was incredibly blessed. I mean, I was, I, I just, God was giving me insight into his word. I was studying diligently. I was teaching. I was serving. I was doing various things. Uh, but it was also a very difficult time because doors just weren't opening. And I had sold my business to pursue ministry and And after 10 years, I was like, oh, man, God, did I miss your call? Am I a total failure? There were some difficult times in it. But hey, be of good courage. God is doing his work. Here's the question. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe God has a calling on your life? And have you forgotten that calling? Have you given up on that calling? Have you let it fall to the back burner? Oh, today, may you rekindle the flame. May you remember God's call on your life. God didn't call you just so you can go to heaven one day. God called you because he wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. That's why he introduced you to Jesus. That's why he cleansed you of your sins, that he might be in an intimate relationship with you, that he might use you to be a builder of his kingdom. You know what one of my my most favorite things in life is? One of my most favorite things as a pastor, to see a man or a woman begin to embrace the call of God upon their life. I'm watching it happen with this man right here. I'm watching it happen with many of you here. I'm watching it happen to this man right here. I'm watching it happen to this man right here. Uh, Many of you, I'm watching God raise you up to an awareness of the call of God that is on your life. I love nothing more. Next week, it's the Carlsbad Street Fair. How many people did JC would be, say would be in this village? How many? And we have something that the world doesn't have. We have the understanding that we were created by a God who loves us, who wants to be in an intimate relationship with us, and sent his son who, who became, God became flesh and dwelt among us and went to a cross to take on our sins that he might give us righteousness as a free gift. If you don't know him, oh, receive that gift today. And if you do know him, oh, go out into the world next week. Endure the hardship of parking and everything else to get here. It's going to be a hassle, but come early, come prepared, come prayed up. And after church, we'll have lunch together and go out into the world And we're going to give you a sticker. You know what it says? It has the mission logo on it, just the M, and it says, what's your mission? And you can go out into into the 120 whatever thousand people are out there and have that on there, and uh, people may ask you, hey, what's that mean? Oh, you know what? Jesus Christ radically changed my life. He died on a cross to forgive me of all my sins. And the joy that I feel having my sins forgiven is amazing. And he'd do the same for you if you just ask him. If you knew the gift of God and who it was who was standing here with you, you would ask him and he would give you living water overflowing as the women just studied on Wednesday and Thursday. Right? Amazing, amazing. And Joseph now, this calling is on his life, but he has to embrace it by faith. By faith. And so important that we don't forget, uh, Joseph we see his immaturity. Uh, uh, we see that he's not quite ready yet. And we see that uh, he's got to go through some hardship. But boy, Joseph, don't forget, embrace this by faith. And again, I'll ask you again, have you forgot the call of God on your life? He called you to be a missionary. And the mission field is right between your two feet, wherever you're standing. And that's why we call this church the mission church, that you might embrace the mission that God has for you. Oh, embrace it by faith. Embrace it by faith. It's amazing. Joseph, in his immaturity, conveyed this dreams, conveyed this calling to the wrong people in his life, to his brothers. And when he conveys the dream to his brothers, do you know what they do to him? We're going to find out. They beat him up. 
Yeah, they beat him up. And here's why. Jesus told us, don't cast your pearls before swine. What does that mean? Is Jesus calling some people swine? No, 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 that's not what he means. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, there's some things that are precious. There's some things that are valuable. And there's some things that not everybody's going to be able to understand. And those you keep sacred. And those you hold on to and you only tell them to the right people. Joseph, in his immaturity, cast his pearls before swine, and they do exactly what Jesus said, trample the pearls and then turn and come and trample you. And that's what happened to Joseph. Uh, Joseph, uh, in his immaturity, errantly conveyed the message. Here's what he said, you're going to come and bow down to me. Well, that's really not the right story. Yes, that's going to happen. God's going to raise him up as the right hand of the Pharaoh. Egypt at that time in the world was the strongest nation in the world. And God is going to raise Joseph up to be the right hand of the world leader, and he is going to be the one who governs the whole entire world. But that's not so he could be bowed down to. What's that for? So he could serve the world. What he should have conveyed is, I'm going to be a servant to all of you, my brothers, and I'm going to take responsibility, and I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to be one who builds you. That's the call of God that is on his life, but is in, in his immaturity, he thinks the call of God is all about what? I want to be the guy who stands up tall and everybody says, you're amazing. That's the flesh. And that has to be driven out of us before the call of God can come into fruition. Has to be driven out. Jesus said it this way, do not be confused. For even, even the Son of Man, even God in human form, did not come to be served, but to what? but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all of you. Wow. Don't think his calling is going to be any different. His calling is not going to be to elevate you. His calling is going to be to make you an amazing builder of other people. That's the call of God. And you know what will happen? When you walk in that call of God, you will automatically be esteemed. You will automatically be elevated but you will not use it for your own glory. You will understand this is God's hand on your life and all glory will go to Jesus Christ. And so this is the work as God begins his story. And maybe you're here this morning and you've kind of forgotten this call of God on your life and you're kind of going through hardship. Here's what I would say. Do you still believe? Do you have faith? For without faith, it's impossible to please God Hebrews 11, 6 says, and here's what James says, do you remember? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials there, little Joseph, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience, a valuable commodity in God's kingdom, a valuable commodity, a valuable character trait in the man and the woman that God wants to use. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, let patience have its perfect work, that you might be what? Complete and entire, lacking nothing. How's that? Yeah, you can lose a son, and you can still be standing on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. You can lose a job and your world doesn't fall apart because you stand on a solid foundation of Jesus Christ. You can have somebody slap you in the cheek and you don't just fall apart and unravel. You don't have to turn to alcohol to comfort you. You don't have to turn to drugs to comfort you because you are perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect doesn't mean perfect like you're, you know, it means that you're, there's nothing lacking in your life. You're standing on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Do you believe? This is the work the Lord wants to do. And this is the work that he's doing in Jacob's, excuse me, in Joseph's life. Um, 
And uh, his brothers uh, hated him for it. They envied him. They can't stand him. Uh, They're despising him. But his dad keeps it all in mind. Verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Shechem is about 50 miles away from Hebron, where they're at right now. So that's quite a journey. 50 miles away, dad says, hey, take all the flock and go feed the flock. Verse 13. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. So he said, here I am, or in other words, at your service. Verse 14. And he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent them out to the valley of Hebron and he, out of the, excuse me, out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem, that 50 mile journey. And so there he goes, long journey, 50 miles, looking for his brothers, doing what his dad told him to do. Verse 15, now a certain man found, found him and there he was wandering in the field there in Shechem. And the man asked him, saying, hey, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me, have you seen them? They were feeding their flocks. Have you seen them? Verse 17, and the man said, oh, they've departed from here. Yeah, I did see them, but they've left from here. They said, let us go to Dothan. Dothan is about 14, another 14 miles away. So now they're 64 miles away from Hebron. Dothan, by the way, is a beautiful Uh, about a 14-acre area of land, which is beautiful for pasturing. Great place to take the sheep. Uh, So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them there in Dothan. Verse 18. Now when they saw him, when they saw Joseph afar off, even before he came near them, just when they saw him a long way away, their stomachs turned. Look what it says. They conspired against him to what? To kill him. Oh my gosh. Then they said to another, one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Yeah, after that first dream, Joseph now has the nickname, the dreamer. Oh, there's that dreamer again. Oh, oh, what happened, Joseph? Did you get hurt? Oh, did you have a dream that you got hurt? I just, everything, it just, it's like constant harassment. And look what they say, verse 20. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. Wow. You see what's happening? What's happening? They are so despising him that they want to kill him, and they've already come up with what? An alibi. An alibi. And we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Crazy. Crazy. Joseph's brothers were livid. They hated him. Why? 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 Jealous. They were jealous. And can I tell you something? Jealousy blinds us. Jealousy blinds us, and it leads us to heinous behaviors. Their jealousy has blinded them. What has it blinded them to? It's blinded them to the call of God that was on their life. And now, who are they working for? Wow. You see, last week we looked, very important message last week. If you missed it, please listen to it. Very important message last week. There are two forces at work in this world. God is saying, hey, look, I want to call a nation to myself. I'm going to bring the Messiah through this people. And Joseph, I have a plan for you in all of this. And he's got a plan for Joseph's brothers too. But at the same time, there's an enemy working and he wants to stop that plan. And guess who the enemy is trying to kill? Joseph. And guess who the brothers are now working for? Somehow, supernatural. Oh, I wish we could see into the spirit world, right? We can't see any of this. We don't ever know any of this, but there's something, there's a force at work. And here are the brothers. Jealousy has blinded them to the call of God that's on their life, and now they find themselves working in the wrong camp. Amazing how it works. Hey, beware of the snares of jealousy. Left unchecked, they will lead to heinous behaviors. Uh, Their jealousy 
had now evolved into hatred. And their hatred had now evolved into action, and their action was murder. Just crazy. Look how far into sin jealousy will take us. Tearing this family apart and bringing these guys who have a call of God on their life to abandon it and to just give, them, give over to jealousy, uh, even to the point of murder. Uh, I found this in the Life Application Bible. I thought it was really good. I want to read it to you. If you have a Life Application Bible, you can probably just find it in your notes right there. Um, it asks this question. Listen to this. Could jealousy ever make you feel like killing someone? Before saying, of course not, look at what happened in this story. Ten men were willing to kill their younger brother over a robe and a few reported dreams. Their deep jealousy had grown into ugly rage and completely blinded them to what was right. Jealousy can be difficult to recognize because our reasons for it seem to make sense to us. I thought that was such a good statement. I'm going to read it again. Jealousy can be difficult to recognize in our own hearts because our reasons for it seem to make sense to us. He's such a jerk. I can't believe he's always doing this. And, and it's all justified in our own mind, our, our hatred towards it. But left unchecked, unchecked, jealousy grows quickly and leads to serious sins. The longer you cultivate jealous feelings, the harder it is to uproot them. The time to deal with jealousy is when you first notice yourself keeping score of others' recognitions, awards, and achievements. Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Hey, Jesus said it this way, that pride is the root of jealousy. You see, jealousy has something, it says, I deserve it more. And Jesus told us that pride begins in the heart. Do you remember where he told us that? Do you remember this? Look at on your, ver on your screens, uh, Matthew chapter 5. This is verse 21 through 22. Read this with me, will you? You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Let's stop there. Yeah, Jesus says, hey, you all know this, right? That you shall not murder. And whoever murders, oh, you're a bad guy if you murder. And murderers go to hell, right? You're in danger of judgment, right? Yeah, you've all heard that, yeah? But look what Jesus says. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of judgment. Wow. Wow, you mean not just murderers? No, 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 Jesus says, no, I tell you, it's, it's just someone who's angry with his brother without a cause. And look at this. And you've heard it said that, hey, whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Raka, yeah, we don't know what that is. That's a, that's a Jewish term of disrespect. It was like total disdain, and it had quite a lot of power to it. And if you used it wrongly, you were in danger of the council. The council, the Sanhedrin, 70 religious leaders who you would be brought before and said, hey, this one was accused of cursing, using Raka of his brother wrongly. You'd be in danger of standing before the, the council, right? The Sanhedrin. But look what Jesus says. But I say to you, let's don't worry about Raka. I say to you, whoever says what? You fool will not be in danger of the council, but be in danger of what? What's it say? Of hell. Of hell. What's that? Yeah, Jesus saying, hey, don't be so worried about the murderers going to hell. I say to you, if you call someone a fool, you're in danger of going to hell. What? Oh, we're all in danger of going to hell then, aren't we? Just driving on the freeway in the morning. <laughs> Look at that idiot, right? Oh, be careful. What's Jesus saying? Here's what he's saying. These sinful acts of murder, they never begin there. They begin in the heart. When you start thinking you're better than somebody else and you call them a fool, it's because you're elevating yourself. And that then becomes, makes, you, makes you think that you're better than them and their life isn't worth anything and it leads to even more heinous sins like murder. Be careful, Jesus tells us. Be careful. Be careful. Joseph's brothers are now blind because of their jealousy and they are now slaves because of their jealousy. 
and their jealousy is controlling their lives even to the point of murder. Here we see a picture of the human nature. May we take note. May we be careful. Verse 21. Let's read more on the story. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said to them, let's not kill him. Good job, Reuben. Let's not kill him. And Reuben said, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit in the wilderness and do not lay hands on him. Uh, Well, Reuben, you kind of just lost it. Hey, I got a good idea. Uh, Don't kill him. Let's just beat the snot out of him and throw him in a pit. And he did this that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Hey, good job, Reuben. I mean, this is better, but I tell you what, uh, it's still not good. Reuben feels convicted, and he knows this is wrong, and he desires to do the right thing, but you know what? He's weak. And instead of just standing up against his brothers, what should have Reuben said? Instead of saying, hey, I got a good idea. Let's beat the snot out of him and throw him in a pit. No, what should he have said? you don't touch him. And if you want to get to him, you got to go through me and I'm going to fight every one of you. But he didn't do that. You know why? Because he was weak in his leadership. And you know what he did instead? He tried to compromise with evil. And it never works. He did it because he said, he did this that he might deliver him and bring him back home to his father. Can I tell you something? He never brought him back home to his father. That never came to pass. Do you know why? Because he compromised with what was evil. You know what's happening, church? The church is losing its flavor. The salt is losing its seasoning. The light is losing its illumination because we're trying to compromise with what is evil. We want to be politically correct and we won't stand for truth. And here's what we need to know. A man of God, by that I mean a human, a man and woman, a man of God has to stand for truth. A godly person must stand for truth. He should have said, kill Joseph, no way, over my dead body. You want him, you got to come through me. I'll never let that wickedness happen. Uh, And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's what we're called to. Have you compromised standing for truth because of the pressure of the world, because you want to be politically correct? Have you? Have you not stood for marriage? Have you not stood for what you knew was right? Have you not, have you just capitulated because you just wanted, and you thought, well, I'll work it out later. Hey, here's what happened. Joseph never came home to his father. And you know what Psalm 1 tells us? Do you remember Psalm 1? May we be Psalm 1 Christians. Psalm 1, what's that? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but what? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. That man will be like a tree that's planted by a river. And he will give fruit all the time because he's got a constant life source. And he will never waver or capitulate. The ungodly are not so. They're blown around like chaff, like a dry, rotted tree leaves just blowing it anyway. Anytime problem comes, they're blowing. But not the man who's Oh, may we be a Psalm 1 man. By man, I mean human. A Psalm 1 man and woman. May we be a Psalm 1 church. Reuben, he tried to compromise with evil, and it just didn't work. Uh, He tried to deliver Joseph out of the hands and bring him back to his father by compromising with evil, and it never happened. Uh, Man, may we stand for truth. Can I just remind you what the Bible says about compromising with evil? Uh, take a look on your screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Read this with me out loud. How can the righteous be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? And how can a believer partner with an unbeliever? And the obvious answer to all these questions is you can't. And if you do not stand for truth, you are partnering with evil. May we be a Psalm 1 man. May we be a Psalm 1 church. Amen? Well, let's finish the chapter and let's, let's look at the rest of this story. 
Um, so it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was, that was on him. Uh, in other words, they beat the snot out of him, and notice, they take the tunic, what they're jealous of. Uh, then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. That pit was actually a cistern. When we go to Israel, you'll see these cisterns. They would dig these giant caves in the sides of the, the hills, and they would write, make these little channels for water to run into these caves when it rained. When the, and like a flash flood, all the water would come, and it would fill it. And then they'd have water in the, in the summer. Uh, this one was empty. they throw them in a cistern. And uh, look at this. Look at verse 25. Uh, they beat the snot out of them. They take his royal robe, they then throw him in the cistern, and look at verse 25, read 25 out loud, will you? And they sat down to eat a meal. What? How wicked is that? They sat down to eat a meal, and you know what? In Genesis chapter 42, uh, we'll read this uh, later in Joseph's life, uh, when Joseph is now raised up, a lot of years later when he's raised up, and he brings his brothers in, uh, they all go, oh, man, they're, they're, they're in prison, you know, the brothers are, and they all go, oh, this is happening to us because we did this to Joseph. And didn't we hear him crying out to us when we threw him in the pit? Please save me, please save me, don't leave me out here to die. He was crying out when he was in that pit. It doesn't tell us that here, but it tells us later. And here they are, he's crying out in the pit, and what are they doing? They're just sitting there having a meal. You know what that reveals? I'm just going to state the obvious. The depravity of man is astonishing. It's astonishing. Despising their own brother, beating the pulp out of him, abusing him, and then uh, just, you know, sitting down for a meal. Just incredible. Let's read what happens. They sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes, and look, there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, myrrh, on their way, carrying them down to Egypt. Yeah, they're bringing all their merchandise down to Egypt for, to sell and to trade. Verse 26, and so Judah, one of the brothers, said to his brothers, hey, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? We don't make any money from that. I got an idea, verse 27, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's get some money out of this. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, all beat up and bloodied, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. Like, that was a Jewish uh, just sign of like, oh, what, oh, Yve, you know, mourning. Uh, and he returned to his brothers, and he said, the lad is no more, and where shall I go? Uh, Reuben, the firstborn, he's going, man, how are we going to go home to dad without the boy, right? And uh, so they took Joseph's tunic, and they killed a kid of goats, and they dipped his tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and they said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? How cruel. How incredibly cruel. Hey, Dad, we found this. Do you know whose it is? Blood all over it. And he recognized, and he said, it's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without a doubt, Joseph is torn into pieces. And Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Crazy. Dad just mourning and heartbroken. Broken. And the sons there going to comfort him when they know then his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him, uh, to, in, sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. Again, the depravity of man is just, just astonishing. 
despising their own brother, beating him, abusing him, and then going to their father with such self-righteousness. Hey, Dad, do you know whose jacket this is? Can you imagine? The callousness of man's heart is shocking. And can I just share something with you? These are the tribes of Israel. These are religious men. These are the ones through whom the Messiah is going to come. Oh my gosh. And may we not be surprised by it. Instead, may we know ourselves. May we know ourselves. May we, may we be aware of what jealousy will do with us. These are our kinsmen. And I don't know about you, but apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, there go I. That's who we are. And this is why we gather in church. And this is why we seek to know Jesus. Because we have these jealous feelings that rage up in us. We have these sins that come to the surface. We have this way in us. And we come to church and we read God's word. And we study his ways and we learn his ways. So we can see again and we can get the blindness taken away and we can get back on track and we can say, Jesus, please forgive me. I've been so mean to my brother. I've been jealous, Lord. I know that's a sin. And we begin to walk again in the path that God has for us, walking in the calling that he has on our life. None of us are above this. This could be all of us. And hey, may we be aware of just how uh, you know, depraved we really are. A cool thing happens when we come to Jesus and say, Lord, man, forgive me. I was on the wrong path. Oh, a cool thing happens. God says, hey, no problem. I forgive you of your sins. I cleanse you of your unrighteousness. I'll fill you with my spirit, and I'll lead you on the right path. That's just who he is. And let me close with this point. Our time is up. Let me close with this. In the midst of this murderous, evil, wicked, scheming, horrid plot, God's plan is still prevailing. God's plan is prevailing. Even as these wicked men scheme and practice deceit, Joseph is going down to Egypt. He's beaten and bruised, but God's hand is upon him. And can I tell you something? The story is not over yet. If you're here this morning and you're going through quite a hardship at the time, may I just remind you, hey, God is at work. His plan is prevailing Nothing escapes his sovereignty. He's using it. It's happening. And he's building in Joseph all that he wants to build in him so that Joseph will be able to handle all that God is going to give him. Church, listen to me a second. It takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. And God is preparing Joseph to hold a full cup. And if you're going through hardship, Andrew, God is preparing your hand to hold a full cup. If you're going through hardship, Tom, God is preparing you to hold a full cup. God's plan is prevailing. It's coming to pass. And in this world, we may get wronged, we may get slandered, we may get abused, but keep your eyes on Jesus. Walk in his ways. He will deliver you, and he will bring your calling into fruition. I'm here as an eyewitness of that. He'll bring it to pass. The story is not up is not over. And God is going to take Joseph even though he's beaten and battered right now, he's going to take him up and raise him up to be a bright light in the world. <clears throat> Will you stand with me? As great as this is, can I tell you something amazing? As great as this is for Joseph and all that God's going to do in Joseph's life, here's the amazing thing. God is doing something even bigger than Joseph's life. Because this story is not about Joseph. Who's it about? It's about Jesus. And God is simply using Joseph to show the whole world what he's going to do through his son, Jesus. You see, Jesus was hated and betrayed by all the tribes of Israel. And Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, just like Joseph. And Joseph, excuse me, Jesus was handed over to the Gentiles 
just like Joseph. And Jesus, yeah, he was, went and preached to the spirits in prison just like Joseph. And Jesus led captivity captive and became the Savior and the deliverer of the world just like Joseph. And Jesus, he became the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning and saving and providing food and nourishment and life to all the people of the earth, just like Joseph. And God is taking Joseph's life and saying, I have far bigger plans for you than you will ever know. And the same is true for the calling that's on your life. It will reveal the glory of Jesus. One last verse to send you home with meditating. Ephesians, on your screens, chapter 3, verse 20. Read with me, one thundering voice. All glory to God, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. His hand is on you. He's calling you to himself. Embrace the call by faith. And may you watch him do this marvelous work. For the praise and glory of Jesus.